Welcome back to another episode of Cape Man Today. I am speaking with Ethan Foreman of the Gloucester Times, as I do every week. And Ethan, for a slow week, we had wind turbine blades, blades falling off and two fires and then even some happy stories, right? You got it. That's pretty much uh, what I'm scrambling around for. Yeah. So uh, let's start yeah. with that blade that fell. That what a um, what an image it is, really. And thank heavens, no one got hurt. Tell us what. Yeah. Happened. And you know, it's it's uh, it's a shame because when I started covering Gloucester, those things were it just gave me so much uh, happiness. You know, it's it's like you, know, you go you go to market basket and you see the little uh, deedly boppers there on the uh, on the hill. But uh, on Sunday, you know, it's, it's interesting. On Sunday morning, I couldn't sleep. I looked at my phone and somebody was like, the wind, the blade fell off the windmill. And I was like, because there's a lot of chatter about the windmill. Yeah, yeah. And it was true. So like, what time was this? What time? This, uh, this is like three in the morning, four in the morning. I'm looking at this. Did the windmill blade fall off? You know, I overslept. I get up, look at my phone. I'm like, oh, Lord. So I ran out to applied materials and I met the guy at the gate who wanted me to show my press credentials and I don't really have press credentials. We're not really, you know, we're not, you know, the, I know the mayor, you know, yeah, it's, more like everybody it's, knows to, you. Do you it's a local, we're a local newspaper. I'm yeah. not sitting there, you know, with the hat and the fedora. Yeah. So I made a, a really nice guy, a really nice guy. Yeah, we you know, shot the breeze for an hour, but I didn't learn anything, but uh, eventually I learned that the blade did. Did fall you off. see it? Did you see it fall? No, off no, I couldn't get anywhere near it. You know, and the thing is, like, what they had done was they set up an, an exclusion zone, so about 450 feet. They didn't want anybody close to it. You know, you never know. Mm -hmm. But you know, yeah. we see, we've seen the pictures. Blade came down really, very close to the base. Looks like it took out. I don't know if it took out a shed or some equipment or something, fencing, mm -hmm. um, and I guess the it did what it, the safety uh, device uh, procedures it behaved as it should. Yeah. So um, I read in your story, I believe that people in the neighborhood heard it, right? Yeah, people heard it. Uh, there was a, a P, uh, Peter Lavasco, who I guess used to do weather for us. Uh, he heard something. Mm -hmm. um, and what did and he also said? Like? He just, he's just described something like just was like a building collapsing on itself over and over again. That he so saw he said he never heard, and wow. I guess he's down on Beach Road. Yeah. So um, they, you know, there's a lot of con I mean, it, look, it raises a lot of concerns for residents. Uh, their city has two windmills. They are closer to the 128 extension, um, although I tend to think it's a little bit of an optical illusion. I don't think if the blades. God forbid another blade falls off. They fall down. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Fall straight down. Right. And how long are the blades? What's their size? No, uh, no, you're you're gonna get me there because I, uh, <laughs> I don't. The numbers are hard. Labor. It's that, really big. <laughs> but that window is like 500 feet. You know. Yeah. Five years. Yeah. Right. So and uh, and I assume there's no conversation yet about why this happened, maintenance issues or anything. Yeah, like I reached out to the company. And they were like, we don't have anything more to add. Yeah. Do you think so, they will? Do you think uh, there'll be a report? You know, um, can I reach out to the city? This is something that I'm working on over the next few days. Uh, you know, obviously it raises issues with the city. Uh, and look, just, just from just from a naive standpoint, looking in, does the building inspector or you know, do, do these people? I mean, they inspect buildings all the time. Right. Um, right. I don't know if, what the inspection. Uh, was like on a windmill. And there are a lot of windmills in the world. Is there a regular inspection done of these these things? You know, does this happen regularly? Yeah, and, I don't know. And I has, mean, is, do we know about wind mil, wind turbine blades falling off in other places? No, I, I don't know. This seems very rare. And uh, this, uh, I think this, this turbine has had problems in the past and has been down. Oh, okay. Um, you know, diff I think it's a different model. Mm -hmm. It's the, you know, the city has, you know, so, but it's, it, you know, it has raised concerns. It's, I'm not going to say, try to say, minimize it. It's, uh, you know, somebody could be, you know, somebody underneath it could have been killed. It was interesting to me too, too, though. The blade fell off and the, and the plant kept going. They didn't evacuate anybody. They oh, were really? Like, Applied materials? Yeah, it was my story. I'd asked about that. And, um, 
people came to work. Well, it's, I guess it's a very, uh, they're in a high demand. They're doing uh, semiconductors and you know how in yeah. demand semiconductors are. Yeah. That's no slight on them. It's just, um, it's at one end of their, it's not near anybody. It's not near anything. It's right. To, yeah. The windmill. Yeah, the windmill. Yeah, they're not near, near people. And so I guess that's the obvious questions, you know, um, uh, and also. One them, isn't one of them right above some buildings in Blackburn Circle? Is that the one that where the turbine fell? No, you know, uh, you're gonna uh, again relatively okay. new to the to yeah. Gloucester okay. and uh, sort of chasing down the the turbines. Yeah. Okay. But this one was it's it's isolated on their on their right. campus. You know, it the blade fell down right at the base. Right. You know. Right. So uh, you know, I don't know. I don't know what's going on, and it's on a private property, so I, I don't really have any access. The funny thing is that the, the, this caused, I think, the biggest impact besides it falling off mm -hmm. was people. I was I was standing there at that gate. People kept coming by looking to get to Happy Valley. <laughs> they needed to get to the dispensary. That was the big crisis. Not yeah. that you know. So uh, the poor the guard, every, yeah. every minute someone would come down, you know, as I, I, marijuana is very, cannabis is a very popular item. I guess so. <laughs> they were like, and he's like, no, they had to direct him down Pond, uh, pond Road. Um, so, uh, you know, that was, I think that was the biggest fallout. Uh, yeah. People weren't able to get, and then, you know, fortunately oh, that, that yeah. was the biggest fallout was the, you know, it was kind of, people needed to get to their can cannabis the, product. The biggest fallout was the blade itself. And after that, it was. And then after that, there was <laughs> the inability yeah. to get to the Great Republic Drive. Right, right. Which I thought was, yeah, which is kind of a funny uh, impact. Well, I think there may be uh, more need for cannabis in this community after two brush fires, after, not after, during, we're still enduring these two brush fires. So a lot of nerves have been shaken uh, in the past week between the blade and now two brush fires, one in Rockport and one in Gloucester. And you've been covering both, right? I did. I haven't been doing too much on the Woodland Acres. Uh, uh, that's more uh, my Cronin. Right. I've been sort of, uh, you know, Monday I covered the, I covered the um, the windmill on Sunday, and then I w just mentioned the crate race. Just want to just do a oh, shout out to right. the yeah. Gloucester Police Department's. Yeah, they finally got no it. parody. They got the wa the water cleared up. Let's just show do a little shout out to them. Yeah. It was great. And we'll get to the youth anglers because that, that's another good story. Or do you want to yeah. squeeze that in? A happy story right here. Let's let's just let's I'm gonna tell you uh, this is the way my week's going. You know, <laughs> windmill, and I'm I'm trying to write about a broken windmill and then yeah. this wonderful event that, that went off at Pavilion Beach. Next year it'll be much, much bigger. And so, these were uh, lobster crates, right? That were stacked. Yeah, well, yeah. You know, they store the lobster, they store the lobsters and then they're plastic crates. And and if you're little, you can hop around and they can get right up. But if you're big, big boys like us, you sink. fall off after 10, you know, five, <laughs> four, three, yeah. you sink, you sink. So it was really great. It was, everyone was in good spirits. Oh, that's and funny. so that was my Sunday. So I took Monday off, but what happened on Monday was Poles Hill fire ignited. Yeah. And uh, the, the fire, um, I think that the Woodland Acres fire, if I want to just make a comparison, it's a much bigger area. Mm. Yeah. It's a much bigger, it's, uh, my, I, my understanding was that the fire was a half mile in from Woodland Road. Mm -hmm. um, I think the fires uh, in, in, uh, on Pole Hill, it's 60 acres and it's surrounded by houses. I mean, it's a, you mean, one end is the hospital. Right. People on Riverview, uh, Riverview Road. Yeah. Right. Um, so, it's, Did you it's say uh, 60 acres? It's about 60 acres, that conservation area. That's what I was told by, um, the you know, so it's, and it's cut, the Sunset Hill uh, uh, Road basically goes over the hill. So I walked that, it's about a mile, and I walked it the other day. Mm -hmm. um, it's a, it, it should have been a subdivision road, but it's not. It's conservation land with Essex Greenbelt. And so it's in a much more compact area. Mm -hmm. I'm not putting uh, woodland acres off. That has been causing uh, uh, concerns and uh, with smoke, but that's a. I think that's a bigger, it might be a bigger, uh, bigger area. But they can't put it out. Well, I think there's they no, don't. It, it backs up to Dogtown, basically. There's no yeah. residential perimeter. There, there, it is on maybe one side, but yeah, just woods. Yeah. So there's a little. I think there's a little bit more of a 
impact on residents and neighbors and residents were seeing you know embers on their um uh, you know coming over yeah. um people Gosh. i think there was some concern that people residents have a concern and uh, police helped them out of their homes uh one night but no evacuations no actual evacuations. well i guess the fire department said that they hadn't called for any evacuations mm -hmm. but i think there were some people who were concerned about the fire coming down the hill mm -hmm. um they, so far they've been able to you know contain it but i think what they're saying is until we get a tropical storm or a big rain we're really not going to have these they're going to just be flare-ups are going to have to be chasing it so is this the same situation that i read is happening in woodland acres where it travels under the ground through the root system yeah so all these all these brush fires can just uh, smolder underground and then they flare and then they flare up yeah so that's also happening at poles hill yeah oh yeah definitely it's all the same dynamic mm -hmm. And yesterday, we're, we're doing this interview on Thursday, Wednesday, there were um, buckets of water being dropped by helicopter. Yeah, and that was really, that was very interesting. So I was, uh, I was talking to a city official and they said, you know, at three o'clock, uh, helicopters, uh, National Guard helicopters are going to land at the O'Malley Innovation Middle School. And, uh, and then from there, go into the Babson Reservoir, pick up water and um, douse the fire. And that was pretty neat. You yeah, know, I and bet. I think, and I think a welcome relief for the firefighters, uh, because you know how it works is you you're in this forest, you it's, you can't it's inaccessible, mm. it's just thick thick brush. You can't just walk into the forest where the fire is. So the state forestry has uh, come in and they've been cutting. They widened uh, Sunset Hill, um, uh, and they have been cutting uh, fire breaks and fire roads into the into the area using real heavy you know heavy equipment. And then using these uh, brush trucks to put out hot spots. That's really labor intensive work. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's not easy work. So I think yesterday it gave them a little bit of a reprieve. Uh, the assistant fire chief, Bob Rivas, was saying they hope that they're hoping they make mud. Interesting. Interesting. Oh, the fire chief, or, you know, that, that was the, that was their, the, you know, they just want to make mud up there. And uh, so they're and, not and dropping the water on fire. They're just dropping it on earth, maybe to make it muddy and wet so the fire can't travel. Is that, you right? know, I, I think, you know, that I don't know, but they are trying to, you know, soak the ground and, and okay. you know, does the hot spots. And, and how they many, use, I'm sorry. Yeah. How ahead. many trips did they make? I, it was a 60 gallon bucket, I think. 600 gallons of water. Oh, 600 gallons in one bucket? Yeah. It's this big, like, I don't know if it's canvas, but it's a big orange bucket they can scoop it's called a bambi bucket it actually has a name <laughs> it's about it's man that's its manufactured name bambi bucket yeah yeah and they scoop it they were scooping out of the reservoir and then flying it over and they kept making sure like, every like two minutes you, the, it would take for them to do that over and over that's and incredible. it was it was yeah it was incredible and those that helicopter is huge you don't realize how big a black hawk helicopter is it's like a size of a school bus Wow, but you would still think that you know a bucket of 600 gallons of water would make it hard to fly you know slush well the, these guys you know my understanding was from the fire chief that they were going to do a training mission so they've been training with this equipment and they they called it in it's not usual to do this in such an urban area you know it's more because you want to be able to they can reach, you know, they, they were telling me that, look, they can reach these areas, but it's really hard to do. And then you have homes. So they called, they, you know, call that in. So it was uh, quite a sight. Everyone was sharing on Facebook. It was a great thing. People were cheering it. Neighbors were like, oh, look at this. I mean, it was just, it's just incredible to see how everyone just thought this was a great thing. And, uh, yeah. you know, so hopefully that, but it's going to, it's until we get that big rain, I think that this is going to be a thing that they're going to be chasing. Well, do we think the bucket will come back, the helicopter and the bucket, and maybe it will go to Woodland Acres or too big an area? Oh, I know. I think, I mean, maybe Woodland Acres is more uh, more suited to it. I, you know, I again, I don't have that inf information. Maybe yeah. it's something we can uh, we'll find have to out. Watch. Right. And if you so, know, if you hear a helicopter over, uh, you buy Woodland Acres, if you hear a helicopter, I let am. us know. And I did hear a helicopter two days ago, like really low over my house. But it only went over once, so um, he wasn't making lots of trips. And I would like to see that. I I feel like I missed something, but um, they could have been using a helicopter to spot where the fire was. Yeah, they, I they think put it up a fire. Yeah, to do with um, the fire.
So can we move on to another happy story this week, the GMGI announcement? Yeah, I mean, it's really good. GMGI is going uh, tuition free. The Biotech uh, Academy is now uh, inviting students to apply and they, the tuition is free, right? Yeah, they uh, GMGI has a biotechnology academy at Blackburn uh, uh, Blackburn Center, and uh, they train uh, young people uh, with high school diplomas or equivalents, and young adults to be lab technicians in a biotech firm, which is a hugely sought after. Um, tens of thousands of jobs are are available, and they're start they they make. They come in and they make more than I do. <laughs> yeah, they're starting salaries. Starting salaries. $50,000. $50,000. This latest class, the class of 20, uh, 2022, $50,000. That's wonderful. Starting wage. And it's a 10 month program. So now think about it. I would get a bachelor's degree. So it's four years. I wouldn't even get the number of hours. I think they could get something like a thousand hours in the lab. I wouldn't even get that much lab experience. Now I have my degree. I'm not putting a degree down. A lot of these kids will probably further their careers and get and get degrees. But in 10 months, they do a seven month um, lab, intense lab, learn how to use this state of the art equipment, state of the art, donated through grants, state grants, state of the art lab. Uh, and they learn the techniques, lab techniques. So you don't have to, they learn enough science and math to be able to do the work as a, of a lab technician. And eventually if they want to further their education that they, they have that foundation. It's a great idea. It is it's a great time. idea. Yeah. Um, they yeah. get 40 spots open for the 20, class of 2023 and they're running in two cohorts. One starting in this August and one in November. And the, through generous donors, um, it's tuition for somebody, it was like something like $9,000. Most of these kids got scholarships um, and now they don't have that. And um, lab fee, they've paid, it takes care of their lab fee. And if a student, you know, look, if you're gonna go 10 months without an income because you're going to this very intensive program, you're gonna need help. So they even have um, a financial assistance available for, for certain people as well, if they qualify. So it's great. So GMGI is just, you know, it's, it's so taking the. It just makes so much sense as to, you know, making these kids even get an associate's degree or something before they go into this kind of work or these people. It's not just kids. It's up to age 30, I think, is eligible. Yeah. And they had one of their, they had uh, somebody in their last class, like, where they're in their mid to mid to uh, mid thirties, you know, so um, yeah. it's, it's not, it's, it's a program that is, focused on bringing this kind of intense training. It's not vocational, like I don't want to use the word vocational training because everyone thinks of something rudimentary. This is world class, high tech um, know how. You don't have to know, you know, you don't have to have super math skills. They're going to teach you what right. you need to do, what do you need to do. And then they go on to two month internships at some uh, Boston or North Shore um, biotech companies. That's incredible. It's That's incredible. incredible. Yeah. You know? it and it's so sensible. You know, I use the word practical. It's practical and sensible to, you know, th these jobs need to be filled. You know, these people are looking for work. And there, traditionally, there have been so many obstacles for someone with a high school degree, you know, trying to move into the workforce in a reasonable way, besides, you know, hospitality. So. And, you know, what's, in what's interesting is Gloucester is not, wasn't known as a biotech hub. Okay. No, no biotech company. I'm sure they have intern internship programs, but this took uh, vision by some biotech leaders. But they're also using Gloucester's, the ocean, the sea, the fishing industry. They're looking at the blue economy. You know, GMGI is is looking in that direction as well. Marine genomics, looking at what you know ge genomics of the oceans, what they can do to help people live longer, or you know, find uh, breakthroughs. So that's got that still has that connection to what, what makes Gloucester great. You know, the fishing industry, the sea. Right. And exactly. We're so going to be the amazing. new Woods Hole. Yes. <laughs> Perhaps. So one more happy story. The, um, the little anglers in the police department 
Yeah, I mean, this is, I mean, you talk about community policing at its finest. You had, like I mentioned, that crate race at Pavilion Beach. You know, all the little kids are a great time, and they were the ones who could do it. And then they're running this youth English program, the which department. the police department, yeah. um, the community impact units, cops and kids, youth English program, uh, bringing together parents and kids on a on the patrol boat. They go for two hours sails. First, they before they go out, they pull up a lobster uh, a lobster trap that's on the dock on the, at Harbor Loop. And they learn about the lobsters. Then they go out on the boat. And some of these kids, a lot of these kids never went fishing or never been on a boat. And they get to spend a couple hours fishing. And we had the great, we caught 15. I didn't catch anything because I wasn't allowed to fish. So you were but with they, them? I was with them. Um, you know, Paul the kids, was there. I saw pictures, right? Oh, yeah. The, Paul was there. We were there on the boat. I mean, it's not a big boat. Yeah. But uh, it Who's was. Whose boat was it? It's a, the it's a police boat. Oh, the police boat. Oh, that's yeah. nice. Yeah, the police boat. Oh. Um, uh, have a, a patrol boat. Um, Do they have any lobster traps, those Gloucester police? There's just only one on the dock. They got a license <laughs> for one. Okay. It's only right. for scientific. <laughs> okay. but they were telling me, no, we can't keep any of the fish. Nobody, we don't have a fishing license. Oh, and the stripers that we're pulling were uh, under tw were under 27 inches. Yeah, yeah. There's oh. a limit. So we, no we were, it was all catch and release. We all did it. And the kids were having a great time. Would they, they have like, kept it if it was a keeper? No, because oh. they don't have a license. Now, if their parent had a license, a fishing license. Well, my husband goes fishing. and Come on aboard to Youth Anglers. <laughs> I, I think he'd like that. He'd probably have more luck. <laughs> they have the, these kids. I don't know what they were doing. I don't know if they have special. I can't. I can't divulge how they were doing it. Yeah, but don't. It, don't, it, don't it, they, were, they were like, we're on. I was. We were. We were talking. We're on. We're getting those fish up. <laughs> and the kids had a. Right, the kids had a great. Time. I had a great. I had a blast. Great way to bring together police. Yeah. And um, little kids, and then uh, it's this young guy, guy yeah, Michael Francis, senior, going to be incoming senior at Gloucester High. He was doing his community service hours, Aww. as well. So um, shout out to Pete Sutera who came up with this idea. You know how he came up with it? It was uh -huh. an Instagram joke. SRO gaming, you know, fishing club or something like that. And people at his Instagram exploded. Hey, how can I sign up? And then they went to the chief. Chief Connolly, Chief Ed Connolly said, that's a great idea. That's and and allowed them to go through it. And Jeremiah Nicastro, who heads up the unit. Yeah. And this is the second year. There have been 150 people they've taken out. Wow. Program, great program. Yeah. Bring in the community. But they're doing it more than once. They're taking kids out on this boat. Oh, yeah. They go out. Like, they had two sessions the day I went. They've, up at 150 people have gone out so far. This summer? Yeah. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. They just oh, go out. Right. And yeah. They bring, yeah. you know, different, different kids, different ages, but uh, we had a great time. And how do kids sign up? I think they sign up through uh, the community impact, community impact unit, unit, through Cops and Kids. All right. Yeah, and I know. They're, they're, it's, uh, it's, they're coming to the end of their season. Uh, they were telling me they're going to do some trips with uh, some young uh some uh children of police officers oh. so if they're, and then they're gonna have a barbecue so it's kind of it's i think they have another week the end. okay all right well that was a lovely story and uh though that community impact unit they are just doing good things all over the city all the time yeah 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 and, yeah. and it's not the kind of policing that you know lowers tensions lets people know police are people and they are you know they're uh, great people and the police in Gloucester are pretty good pretty great guys so yeah and kids get to be familiar with the police in a positive way so um no it's a, it's really a great program you know if you've been on a fishing boat and then you have a problem you you can go you can go to one of these guys you know pizza um the middle school uh, school resource officer so you know if they've gone fishing with this with pete and uh you know you got something that's bothering you you can go you know you can go to them yeah. And that's the idea. No, they're really doing great work. Okay. What's next, Ethan? What are you working on next? <laughs> or are you taking a break? You're going no. for a swim. Tonight, yeah. there's going to be a candidate. Uh, well, Thursday night. So I'm going to just, uh, the, last night, there was a, a candidate's, uh, candidate's forum for the 5th Essex and Margaret Ferranti and um, uh, Nate uh, Mulcahy are in the Democratic primary on September 6th. And there's also a Republican who's mounting a write-in campaign uh, to get her name on the ballot for the general election, Ashley Sullivan. 
Mm-hmm. Uh, and Margaret Ferranti, however, I spoke to her yesterday, is, uh, tested positive for COVID. She won't be able to attend in person. There's a Zoom component of this, so hopefully uh, we'll see what happens tonight if she's able to participate. If not, the organization called uh, Essex County Community Organization plans to send out her, you know, get her responses to the questions. And uh, we'll see. But it's that's what I'm doing tonight. All right. Well, well last uh, night. Yeah, yeah. We're we're talking on Thursday, and people will be listening to this on Friday. So, I assume if there's a Zoom component, component, they will be able to watch this debate. Or is it a debate or a conversation? It's they're calling it a, a forum. Forum. Okay. Right. So, so yeah, there there should be a way to do it. And this is for the. Uh, fifth, uh, fifth district? Fifth ethics. Fifth ethics. Fifth ethics. Yeah. It's yeah. a seat that's been held since, uh, well, uh, Anne Margaret Front has served in that seat since 2009. And the district changes and Manchester becomes part of it. So uh, whoever wins uh, in November now represents Manchester, Rockport, Essex, and Gloucester. So that there's a shift in the in the uh, in the That's district. Interesting. So Jamie Belcito, who won that seat um, in the special election, she will no longer be representing Manchester. She her district has been uh, eliminated essentially. Um, she could have run. Uh, I think she could have run for the seat held by Sally Karens of Danvers. Mm-hmm. I think this because she lives in um, Jamie lives in uh, Topsfield. So I think that's. Um, I don't think so. So, um, you know, she did a good job last couple of years representing the, the folks district. Manchester now falls under the 5th Essex district. Presently, the seat is held by um, M. Margaret Ferranti. Right, right, great. All right. Well, um, I look forward to watching that tonight. And thank you, Ethan, for all your hard work this week. It's a hot week and there's you've had falling blades and <laughs> falling ash. And <laughs> it's who know who knew this job could be so cataclysmic right yeah i just i just say saint saint peter viva saint pedro nothing happens okay <laughs> all right well we will talk to you next week okay thanks heather good luck out there bye thank you interested in a sponsorship email sponsor at 1623studios.org to learn more